Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of Signs, Planets, and Stellar Rhythms. My name is Eric Roth, Shamanic Astrologer, and I bring to you today episode four uh, of this uh, continuing series that I've been doing to help inform everyone around that is interested in, in listening to and, and watching about shamanic astrology and how it can be applied to uh, various things. But in this case, we're looking at the, uh, the timings uh, what's going on in the sky, uh, the planets, what they're doing and their implication uh, here as we live our lives, uh, during, especially during this crisis. But this is an episode series that will continue beyond that, uh, beyond the crisis and in, in, in the coming years as well. So I'd like to share with you some uh, major points that are going to be part of this. So episode four, um, what we're going to be doing here is diving into some major parts that are uh, in part continuing from the previous episodes, but also adding some other uh, additional details and new information that uh, I'm going to bring forth in, in this particular episode. So we're going to look at that as we, as we move forward and to, into the uh, following slides and uh, show you some, some other details that uh, may be different for you or especially if you're following other kinds of astrology that this is a, a little bit different interpretation and in how uh, that astrology comes forward. So let's, uh, let's uh, crack on here with this information on episode four. So these are the main topics of the discussion for today. Um, the Dance of Gemini, this is a really prominent uh, thing that's going on in, uh, uh, that's been building up since, uh, since April, um, and especially since Venus has gone into the sign of Gemini. And May is really one of the, uh, the, the kind of the climatic part of that Gemini uh, feature. And then we're going to talk about Mars and Pisces. Mars just recently entered into the sign of Pisces, not the, uh, the constellation, but the sign of Pisces. So we're going to provide some, I'm going to provide some information about that and talk about what that means. Center and density, uh, de density and guidance. Uh, we're going to be looking at this, at this time period that's upcoming here around the theme of 2020 and what this really means for humanity the, and this year in particular uh, as we move forward. But this is, we're moving into kind of the center area. These uh, various planets are going retrograde. Uh, and this really remarks the sort of the, at least in this year, the center point of that, the turning of that wheel uh, for, for 2020. Also gonna have some commentary around um, uh, judgments. Uh, and the non-judgmental uh, way or philosophy or principle of shamanic astrology and what that brings in, since it's a, it comes from a holistic standpoint in its uh, expression as a paradigm. But first, I'd like to, to dive into an acknowledgement and invocation. So if we could uh, sit with ourselves and take some deep breaths and acknowledge and honor uh, creation itself, uh, all our relations, the stars, the planets. Um, this is, we are all part of this cosmic creation and uh, there is a transmission that goes back and forth that isn't just that we are being informed by the cosmos or mother earth, but there is a transmission that we are also uh, going forth into into the stars, into the celestial realm, and also uh, with our deeper relationship with Mother Earth. So we acknowledge and thank all of creation, all our relations, the elements, the stars, the planets, all the constellations, and Mother Earth, the great spirit for this life, for all that we are, and the opportunity to experience as souls incarnate into matter, into our physical realm, to physical body, this journey that is life and the opportunities that come with that. 
and that each experience be a crisis or a moment of joy is part of that experience and that gift that we have we can take advantage of within ourselves to live in harmony with Gaia and the cosmos and especially in tune and resonant with our our soul's intent in this lifetime. I thank all that is present, all the spirit guides for each person watching and myself in this moment of creation that is always unfolding uh, and that everything is in, a, is in motion, everything is in change. Ah, and it is so. All right, shifting gears a little bit here as we take a few moments to come back into ourselves and uh, connect with who we are um, as we uh, come into this physical realm and this matter and experience what our life is like. Each of our individual selves are connected to all of creation, all our relations, every person on the planet. This is obviously shown out by uh, the principles of quantum physics, all the molecules uh, connected. Now, uh, with that said, um, we experience ourselves as individuals here on this planet, as we feel that we are uh, you know, born by ourselves from our mother's womb, and we die in the, in the frame of our physical bodies at the end of our life. But in that space of time, and even after that time, we are connected. We, are, we rejoin Mother Earth, we rejoin the cosmos, and we, that's from whence we came, from that place. And so <clears throat> we can see reflections of ourselves and others as we journey through this life, that qualities that we enjoy connecting with and qualities that we don't. And in those reflections, we're seeing a part of ourselves that we may, may or may not like. And this could trigger in our interactions with others, judgments. And of course, this is part of uh, human beings and their ability to uh, analyze and see things, be able to categorize things, be able to bring order into the world into our lives especially but everyone is prone to judgment everyone including myself is prone to reactions that uh may not may or may not be entirely healthy and stir you know deeper wounds uh pains that we've experienced in our life that may be triggered by other individuals and uh, as we go through our life in the philosophy of shamanic astrology, this is uh, the shamanic astrology paradigm. It was created by Daniel Giamario, longtime uh, astrologer, uh, co-founded the school um, in uh, really in the 2000s. Um, one of the main principles of this is that shamanic astrology is non-judgmental in its essence. So that means it's not about looking at things as good or bad, or that one thing is better than another, you know, in the, in the case of astrology would be signs and planets uh, that none are better than one another. They all have a role to play. They all have a voice. It's a holistic approach to the astrology. So it does away with um, uh, references around rulerships or uh, benefics, or benefics and, and malefics which is language that was uh, carried over from many centuries ago in, in the astrology world. And there are some astrologers that still use it, but in this paradigm, we try to steer away from that. However, we, we do acknowledge that we're still in a dualistic uh, uh, paradigm and, uh, and the, collect, the human collective. You know, there's the sun and the moon, there's night and day, and there's still good and bad. There's still, uh, you know, uh, heaven and earth. So there's still the, everything is in all these pairs. So when we see the opposite, when we see something that may not seem uh, like it's us, uh, we may find a certain judgment upon it. And so during times of crises, these judgments can be elevated. These time, these vulnerabilities within us, these uh, this dualistic um, 
part of ourselves can be magnified and uh, we become more vulnerable to assessing judgments upon others. Um, and other crises, even political crises, as we've seen here in the United States, and certainly across the world, you know, they've seen that uh, come and go. So when we have judgments, there are wounds that are triggered in a wide variety of ways, creating more raw reactions out of painful moments in our lives. And it's uh, guidance around this is to practice non-judgment, is to be able to perceive on some level uh, what another person may be feeling or experiencing in their words or actions, being able to the whole adage of putting yourself in their shoes for a moment, being able to feel what they feel and have some semblance of empathy or, uh, you know, understanding on some level, or, or at least an attempt to try and understand what that experience might be like. Um, and it's taken uh, sort of a, a introspection into, into the reaction uh, and trying to uh, work with that rather than um, uh, elevating or escalating uh, a, a particular uh, crisis by uh, adding more uh, judgments upon uh, the experience with the other person or an organization or perhaps even a government is to be able to at least see what's going on, to have a broader view. Um, and this could even be uh, connected to uh, different wavelengths that are archetypes that uh, may be present uh, for us. And we all feel moments of judgment upon others at an individual or a group level. And it is beneficial to perceive within ourselves where our own fears, wounds, or perhaps uh, uh, perhaps others linked experience that may be at the core of why we share the judgment. So it's taking some moments, even if it's just a few minutes, to allow that exploration, that meditation, uh, to to come to convey maybe uh, all, uh, other ways of of being able to respond to another human being um, and having effective communication rather than. Uh, simple straight out arguments which may or usually do not convince other people and they usually cannot convince you especially if you're feeling set on something this can give you maybe an under a little deeper understanding and but one of the benefits about crises is that there ends up can there can end up being a common ground from which to come together and be able to explore the differences of each other within the boundaries of this crisis. And so this is giving us an opportunity to have more effective communication in this crisis and connect with each other in this, uh, in this element here. Um, one of the things that um, in shamanic astrology that, and, and really in regular Western astrology that shows up strongly with judgment is, is the old uh, version of what Saturn, uh, the planet Saturn represents the, the mythological and the sort of the judge and the the jury and the executioner all uh, handing down you've been bad you know uh, you need to be punished kind of a thing so that was not what saturn originally stood for uh, during the golden age of humanity which was you know well past five four to six thousand years ago uh, but it was only when the the patriarchal uh, communities and, and um, cities and nations came about that it uh, Saturn was uh, uh, corrupted in a way to have more of the shadow elements of that archetype be present. So these are just something, uh, things to consider, to connect with, and uh, in your own life, in your, in your relationship with your family and your lover, uh, your uh, colleagues and friends and so forth. So currently right now we're going through a lot of retrogrades and this is just a reframe of uh, retrogrades we ta I talked about in the last episode so that these uh, you know these planets uh, especially the outer planets can spend a long time in retrograde and Pluto roughly five and a half months in retrograde. I mean, the longest of them uh, being in that space uh, for Neptune and uh, Uranus, you know, roughly around five months. Uh, Saturn in that 
close to that same space, Jupiter a bit shorter than that. Um, so on May 10th, Saturn went retrograde on May uh, yesterday, Venus went retrograde, which has the shortest amount of time um, uh, in, in the, you know, per annum, per annual uh, uh, rate. Uh, Mercury, obviously, only three weeks each time, but it can be retrograde three or four times a year. And then um, Jupiter will be on the 13th slash 14th, depending on where you are on the, on the globe. Uh, but all these planets right now are are going retrograde and or, you know, after a long period of being direct uh, for many planets. So it's a standstill moment. These are times of like introspection of taking a vaccine, like analyzing things. And we can see currently in the, at least here in the United States and uh, in Europe, uh, they're starting the process of figuring out like how to get humanity moving again, how to like, where do we go and be open again? How can we live our lives again after, you know, this long period of, of lockdown. Some countries are still in the thick of, of, of significant uh, challenge. And uh, the United States is kind of in the in-between zone right now, trying to figure this out as an example to this. And each state, I think, will have its own uh, rules. But during the retrograde, during the stillness, the standstill, where the planets are, uh, you know, not moving in the sky, you know, we can, we can connect with that introspection and go like, okay, there's a concentration here. There's a, there's a situation we can really uh, tap into and, and open up to and go, okay, so what is really happening and analyze it um, with uh, Jupiter and Capricorn, with Pluto and Capricorn, Saturn and Aquarius, and they're all clustered together. They can all uh, contribute to that experience. I'll be talking about Venus more so in a moment when I get into Gemini but this is this is one of the uh, inf pieces of information to continue to for us to continue to connect with and realize that this is what's going on uh, collectively out there. Venus retrograde. Another thing I talked about in the last episode. This is just a reminder because at the time of this recording, Venus just went retrograde the day before. Uh, so, you know, Venus is staying in. Gemini for four months. It's only been in Gemini now for a little over a month um, and includes 12 days where Venus will be invisible to the naked eye, switching from the evening sky to the morning sky, uh, which, will which will take place in uh, early June, right around the beginning of the second week of June, June 9th and 10th. And she will, the last time she went through this process was in, uh, uh, late October and early November of uh, 2018. So this is that uh, a rebirthing moment of Venus as it um, uh, metamorphosizes into uh, uh, the sign of Gemini. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what Gemini represents more fully as we go on to this, but there are many people out there that explore Venus more fully more deeply, I may do end up doing a, a shorter video just specifically on the Venus cycle uh, and taking a look at that uh, for those that are interested in, in watching that. Um, but can, uh, there's a, a process called Venus Alchemy, a, um, a class, that uh, an ongoing class that Kaylin Castell and Tammy Brunk uh, teach. Um, there are others that teach, uh, other astrologers that share about uh, Venus. Uh, a person I'm connected with, another astrologer, Emily Trinkus, also uh, heavily talks about Venus, and she's taught classes as well. Um, so I'd encourage you all that are interested in learning more and more about Venus, that that would be another one. Uh, the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, of course, does classes, a specific class that's tailored toward um, specific cycles. Um, one of them is called the Synodic Cycles. Uh, aka living wisdom of the inner planets and one of the features of that is the Venus synodic cycle so if you want more information about that feel free to to contact me but here's a kind of just a, a small breakdown of uh, Venus retrograde and what it's doing on this particular slide shape-shifting into uh, another now what's coming up here is some import, other important dates um, beyond what has happened. As you can see here, I've got listed uh, the different retrogrades uh, than the moon conjunctions that have happened. 
and then Mars entering Pisces. Uh, May 13th, even today, the, the day of this recording, Mercury is uh, intended, or at least there is the first possibility of being able to see it in the evening sky, which is going to be interesting and an uh, echo of, or, or a symbol of what, uh, a collective what, uh, of planets, collection of planets that are gonna be visible in the evening sky towards the end of May. Jupiter stations retrograde, as I mentioned, uh, uh, basically tomorrow, uh, today slash tomorrow. Uh, there's a Moon-Mars conjunction in Pisces, May 14, May 15, Venus-Vesta conjunction in Gemini. That Vesta is one of the uh, major players in that sign coming up in the, in the big collective. Uh, the Sun, another huge collective uh, uh, player in this. Uh, the Sun enters Gemini May 20th. May 22nd, Venus and Mercury conjunction uh, at 20 degrees, 11 minutes, Gemini. And then we have when the moon, for two and a half to three days, the moon moves through the sign of Gemini, and there'll be six planetary or uh, celestial points in the sign of Gemini. Moon, Mercury, Venus, Vesta, Sun, and North Node, all in the sign of Gemini between the 22nd and 24th. So this is uh, really a, a, a powerful time uh, for Gemini. And then Venus on May 27th, 28th, Venus actually disappears from the evening sky. This is, that begins that horn metamorphosis phase for Venus, uh, a period of about uh, 12 plus days to uh, be, enter uh, between the orbit of Earth and where the sun is located. So that's when it'll be hidden from uh, our naked eye. Of course, with those with binoculars and telescopes, may be able to see it for longer periods of time um, up until the point where it's uh, uh, too close to the sun to see. All right, so let's dive into Mars and Pisces. So on May 12th, which was yesterday, uh, as of the day of this recording, uh, the red planet ingressed into the sign of Pisces. This is the same day as uh, Venus station retrograde. A lot of stuff took place. Celestially speaking, there were many um, uh, moon uh, conjunctions with uh, the, uh, the planets of, uh, that were kind of in that 2020 theme, Saturn and Pluto and Jupiter, and then uh, Mars a few days later. So there was a lot of activity happening on, on May 12th. Uh, so Mars, Mars moves into Pisces, has moved into Pisces, spends about, since 47 days. And during this time, we'll have a conjunction with Neptune. Uh, Pisces will, uh, is, is a sign on the, uh, of, uh, you know, I call it a billboard bearing healer empath archetype. So it's like the, the greater symbol of the, of the healer empath. Cancer has uh, a lot of resonance with Pisces, but Pisces kind of has that, um, you know, might say that elevated position or uh, more symbolic of the healer. Um, the one who gives itself in selfless service to others and to spirit, whereas cancer is more connected to uh, family orientation. Pisces is, is not so much about that. It's more about um, in the individual and seeing the, the oneness of it all. Pisces is one of the giver signs. There are three others that are listed in shamanic astrology as giver signs, with an honorary fourth being uh, Libra. I would say uh, Pis Pisces, Cancer, Capricorn, and Virgo, they're all giver signs uh, in, in considered in shamanic astrology. Uh, and so it feels a need to give through its uh, generous, heartfelt support, providing a safe space and volunteering in times of need. Pisces is a dreamer, a romantic, a provider of ecstatic experiences, and an empath. It feels. So it truly is this um, uh, feeling function. It really comes from the space of the heart. And it does this through selfless service. So it's not so much about ego. It's not so much about fulfillment of ambition or, or monetary needs, but it's about giving. And that giving experience fulfills what the archetype wants to experience. 
So uh, these are the qualities that Pisces brings. And so Mars coming through here, this brings the masculine to a place of heart vulnerability and spiritual cosmic connection. And with Neptune nearby, for much of the time, Neptune during this time sits in the, in the low 20 degree range of, you know, uh, in the sign of Pisces. And so Mars is going to be spending uh, a time uh, with that. In fact, within 10 degrees of Mars and Neptune, this is uh, about a month period between May 28th and June 29th, just around, just after the time that Mars enters the sign of Aries at the end of June. So the masculine is here to both provide help to all through selfless acts and experience a dissolving of its original form which can be a bed for an identity crisis. This can also create a highly sensitive time in the world. So this is for the masculine, the patriarchy, this is really an interesting time with Mars coming through Pisces. Maybe uh, the, uh, from a uh, optimistic standpoint, it's, it's about more of a heart opening, more of, of, of giving compassion. Maybe you're in this crisis, this could be an experience where there is more, um, uh, selfless loving of those in need, of those in trouble, those that are uh, are more vulnerable. Uh, maybe this is will have a, an increased effect of, of more compassion and empathy for that, and for our our greater place in the cosmos and connecting, realizing that we're all in this together. That this isn't this isn't a separate uh, s political battle. That this is all of us uh, contributing. Uh, to uh, a greater uh, space and, and welcoming for humanity to, to experience a better time on this planet without the, uh, uh, the where we've been is in this place of almost uh, frantic madness of, of racing and ambition and, and always, always, always moving and moving and moving, especially here in the United States. And maybe we can uh, connect with that place of heart in a with, with Mars coming through Pisces, but it can also create where if we have a great attachment to that franticness, that always needing to do, always need to go, uh, that fear and that panic, um, uh, we may feel, a, uh, in our, each of us an individual crisis, or at least on a collective, especially around the masculine, and uh, the breaking down or the dissolving of uh, those attachments. So that could uh, create some, some challenges there, but ultimately, ideally, it's, it's more about the heart opening and, and hopefully the embracing of that heart uh, during this time. So Mars and Pisces, this is what it looks like in the sky. Um, and we can see here Mars in the water bearer constellation, what astronomers call Aquarius. Um, we see Neptune right here, not far, only 20 degrees away. This is taken on May 13th, the day after. So early in the morning is, is when you would be able to see Mars. And this is just taken from the West Coast where I am here in Oregon. We can see that Mars was uh, recently with these planets in, in March. Um, and so see how, how far in distance it's traveled. It's now, Mars is now uh, close to uh, 30 degrees away from Saturn and more than 30 degrees away from uh, Jupiter and Pluto. So these are, this is kind of the setup. And there's, a, there's Ceres is not far also in Pisces, uh, the dwarf planet that represents the great mother. Um, and uh, the wounding, in, sec in, some, in some cases, the wounding of the, of the power that was stolen or taken by the patriarchy of the uh, matriarchy, of the feminine, uh, the power of the feminine. And this may be uh, have a subset of uh, subplot of, of Mars, the masculine and feminine may be finding some level of coming together and healing uh, one another in that uh, ancient wound. We have Fomalhaut, which is a star that represents the southern fish, is also connected to that um, uh, representative of the celestial heart. And so we can see in, in, in the, the greater oceans of, of the celestial cosmos here. So Fomalhaut is a star that will stand out for those of you that are up early in the morning. And this area of the sky will become more prominent as we get into uh, the southern, uh, the summertime here in the northern hemisphere. And of course, uh, in the winter time uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Mars's journey, 
May 12th, entered Pisces. May 14th, there was the Moon-Mars uh, conjunction. Um, that, that's happening uh, very soon from the recording of this video. And that's just kind of a, there'll be two Mars-Moon conjunctions during the time that Mars is in Pisces, May 14th and June 12th. Um, so each of those, uh, and the June 12th one that will bring in Neptune's energy, this one is more connected to uh, Fama Hot and, uh, you know, really the uh, embracing of the heart of, of opening up and going, realizing, hey, wait a minute, that's part of ourselves too, the human part. And, and not just the logic and the, and the rationale, uh, but the, uh, the spiritual connection, the, the heart feeling connection. This is what it's, it's opening up to. So, and then we also have on the 20, May 24th, Mars conjunction with Ceres. This is what I just briefly mentioned about the, the masculine and feminine connection, that the great mother and, and connection to even mother uh, Earth, Earth mother, Gaia, this is a, a, an activation of that point. Now, if during these times, it isn't just the exact conjunctions that are important, but the, the, the building up of that and then the release of that. Uh, so the days leading up, usually uh, in the case of Mars, several days, like up to uh, three or four days, and then uh, three or four days after that period. So it isn't just the one moment of conjunction. And then on, on uh, June 13th, of course, we have Mars conjunction with Neptune. The moon will be there uh, on the 12th, and so it doesn't has it hadn't moved very far the next day. This is a, a, a presents a greater uh, connection to the uh, wider celestial realm and the dissolving of previous attachments of what we thought Pisces might have represented or our middle world attachments that are no longer um, uh, serving us and maybe helping us, um, us you know, being able to, to create a more heart opening uh, experience in ourselves and uh, understanding that the, the benefit of that in our lives and the benefit of letting go and experiencing more of, of love in our lives rather than um, fear and or darkness and, and or you know, projected of anger. This could, this could open up all kinds of things within us to help us embrace that which is within. Then we move into uh, to Gemini here and we talk about, uh, as you can see here on this uh, image, all these points here in, this is May 23rd. This is a date I'm gonna uh, share with and what it looks like in the sky. Obviously the, no, the lunar nodes are not uh, visible. They only uh, are uh, points in the sky that represent where eclipses uh, could happen when uh, the moon and sun come together as a, as a new moon or as a uh, full moon. So May and June are, are significant, not just for the fact that three planets station retrograde, but also that because of the amount of planets and other points in the sign of Gemini. So this Gemini factor began to develop on April 3rd when Venus ingressed into Gemini. And then Vesta had already begun that journey two weeks earlier. So then there's, there's three conjunctions this year between Venus and Vesta, the asteroid Vesta. Then came the lunar nodes, which moved into the Gemini Sagittarius axis on May 4th, Mercury on May 11th, and just recently, a few days ago, followed by the sun on May 20th coming up, and then the moon on May 22nd. Uh, the moon only uh, moves fast through the sky. It only stays in a sign on average every two and a half days. Uh, the sign of Gemini uh, is the trickster archetype. It's the Imagineer, it's the shapeshifter, the Coco Pelli. In modern day, it's the equivalent to the image of Peter Pan, a somewhat androgynous energy that can break the rules and make them up uh, as it goes along. It doesn't, Gemini doesn't typically adhere to the current norms or laws in the same way that, that most other signs do. Gemini's role to help society is with perspective through creative communication and wild brilliance. I could even add the word fun into that, um, into that sentence. The intensity that has happened in recent months here on the globe 
is, uh, you know, is definitely a, uh, uh, an age defining intensity. And with this collective energy in Gemini, we can fully, uh, more fully embrace and at least balance out the connection to realize, hey, wait a minute, this, it, human also, human, being human also means having joy, having experiences of fun, having experiences of connection and communication, and having, you know, contra contrary differences of opinion and being able to celebrate and, and, and open up and have effective communication through that process rather than uh, bottled up and fixed and just simply sticking with what you believe, but opening up to the possibility of what others believe as well. And realizing that the mind can be a powerful tool in that arena of being able to tap, tap into the, to the fun, to the, to the energy of the sacred clown or the, uh, the divine comedian or the jester and being able to, to share the stories in, a, in an entertaining way. So let's, this is a, this is a time to connect with that and at least balance out all the intensity that's, that's going on with the Saturn, Pluto and Jupiter uh, connection. We know that Sa that Saturn recently went retrograde and it's going to right now in Aquarius, it's going to be uh, by at the end of the summer, it'll have um, moved back into uh, the sign of Capricorn. So just something to, uh, uh, I think it, really is more by my mid to late summer that it does that. I'll probably have the dates for that in the coming, uh, coming episodes as we move along. But I just want to uh, stress the importance of, of connecting with this energy as, as to help balance out that it isn't just this uh, bad, quote, bad stuff when you, we always read in some of the headlines that I see uh, that it's just about the, the bad news, but not about some of the the beneficial news that's coming through and the silver lining of this experience of being able to be in the crea uh, uh, the cauldron of creation right now for ourselves. Uh, tap into that powerful imagination, creative energy. Um, so, you know, each person will have different wavelengths and experiences with that, with creativity. We might have some uh, attachments to what creativity really is, but open up to the different ways creativity can be experienced in almost infinite ways. So that's one of the uh, um, uh, sharings that I wanted to bring forth in this video. And here on May 23rd, um, we can see this collective happening. Um, in the e early evening sky, uh, just after sunset, you may be able to see a thin crescent moon that I've labeled Luna, just for creative purposes. Um, Luna, the moon, um, and then we see uh, Venus, uh, one of the last days that we'll be able to see Venus before it disappears in the glare of the sun, which will be the brightest of, of all this here. We see Venus has been hanging out with a particular star, which is the tip of the horn of the bull constellation, and uh, which is also a, uh, has a long mythology uh, with, uh, and, and connection with, the goddess Inanna and the, and the divine feminine and the matriarchy and the turning of the ma turning over the matriarchy into the patriarchy uh, over 4,000 years ago. And then we have Mercury in the sky now more brilliantly lit. And then we also have Vesta. Now Vesta won't be visible, but it's present. And I've labeled it here so you can kind of see where you need to guide your eyes to, uh, you know, realize, Hey, it's there. I can connect with that. And it's all in Gemini. So Vesta brings a sacredness to the experience of Gemini during this time, a sacredness. So it's making that sacred within, experiencing divine fun or uh, a sacred communication with others. This is a, 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 an, a, an amazing time which we can do a ceremony, personal ceremony for ourselves or even if, if we are able to get together with small groups of six to 10 perhaps with friends, that would be a great time. We can see the star Betelgeuse may or may not be visible uh, during this time because it's just after sunset. So, and, and Betelgeuse is not as bright as it used to be. Uh, as we know, it's been uh, dimming and it's starting to kind of show signs of life, but we don't really know uh, 
you know, it's kind of an almost an unpredictable star. Um, and here, this point at the feet of the twins and the hand of, of Orion, sometimes people call it the high man, the hand of the high man or the hunter. Uh, and then the, between the, the, bull, the, the bull's uh, horns, we see the galactic extreme or galactic edge. This is the June or Cancer solstice point um, that happens. And summer for the Northern hemisphere, winter for the Southern hemisphere. And so that's the point where the sun will be on in, in uh, June 20th, 21st, roughly, uh, where that will that solstice point will take place. So the thin crescent moon should be visible for those that uh, have a clear, much clearer horizon. You'd need a telescope to be able to see uh, Vesta. And then um, uh, the moon should be uh, somewhat visible. Of course, Mercury and Venus uh, should be fairly easily visible during this time. There's another star that's off uh, more to the north uh, west. That's Capella, part of the Auriga constellation, the, the, uh, the the chariot. Um, so this is the uh, one we can uh, connect with, one of the, uh, the Bohemian stars that's out there. Um, the Betelgeuse is, a, is another. That's a, a whole different topic itself and one that I've been uh, doing research on. We'll share more in the future. Uh, center and density guidance. This is, uh, this is something, just some, some words to share uh, around this time. So as the you know, kind of a, uh, a summary of what I've been uh, talking about here. At, as the retrograded planets and the collective of planets in Gemini share their wisdom, imagination, and rebirthing process, Mars and Pisces, with Neptune's help, shares its heart. There is greater balance here than there was in February, March, and April, which acted like an accelerated compression of our third dimensional reality. In the stillness of our early, of the early retrograde period, which is happening right now, there is also a flurry of activity as the mind finds emerging co-creative thought, an opportunity to break from to break the hold over of over over constrictive beliefs adopted from our conditioning. So that part of that is happening right now and has been. Uh, over the especially over the last few months with the uh, crisis that's happening, the COVID-19 crisis. This is also a time of season of flowers in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's spoken to by the descent of the light in the Southern Hemisphere. But the season of the sun in Taurus, and as well as Uranus contributing, sets a seasonal energy of pleasure and well-being, striving to savor the moments and time to experience the gift of Gaia. So in this uh, crisis where, uh, you know, there is uh, a pandemic raging, there's also this uh, stillness and pleasure that can be experienced in the world right now, depending on where you are. Um, and it's, it's uh, up to us to be able to perceive it, be able to tune into that ourselves. When all of this is alchemized, it can become a season of uncertainty, but also a window into our collective soul's desire to manifest beyond the madness of the current 21st century. So it isn't just this year, but what has come prior. Insights, glimpses, including humanity's real potential are abound as we slowly understand our collective hangover. So we've accelerated rapidly in humanity for many decades. And we're now at a place where there's a breakdown, a, a crisis, a collapse, a, uh, you know, a, a health crisis, obviously. And we're having to manage it and balance it and find ways to uh, protect ourselves, but also to not shut out our lives because over security or over protection can do just as much, if not more damage than the actual agent that could that is uh, uh, moving through humanity right now as a virus so when we insulate ourselves for too long there are um, 
a number of things that can happen within us, especially psychologically, that can be really damaging. And I know I'm personally experiencing uh, the effects of, of self-isolation that is um, not, you know, it's not pleasant. Although I'm, I'm finding ways to utilize this through creative expression, like doing these videos and writing articles more and uh, working with that and communication with, with more people out there as much as I, as I can um, until we can um, uh, move about more, you know, and, and be able to go to restaurants and coffee shops, which I, uh, I miss going to a coffee shop. I miss going to uh, places where I'm not seeing people uh, uh, moving about and avoiding other people because they're scared to even get within close proximity. Um, it's almost, uh, uh, I think it's almost overkill in certain respects, but it's not that I don't understand this, but it's, it's, it just feels, uh, too much. It's too much. Cause that by doing that, it actually spreads the fear amongst the populace even more. And just walking down the street and seeing people cross the street because, uh, or avoid me because they're, uh, they you know, for the protective measures and the social distancing, it does have a effect that takes place. It may be subtle at first, but over time it, it can build up. So, you know, uh, this is a time when we can maybe try to exercise as much patience as we can to also experience joy in our lives, to uh, certainly balance our rational uh, energy and security with the desire to be human and, and connect with others. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's a whole different part of this that I can talk about, but it's beyond the confines of this particular video, which I'll go into it at a later time. But I, I just wanna uh, share that I wanna wish you all well uh, during this time of, of crisis and uh, to experience whatever you can in the form of, of human connection and how important that is to have in this world. Uh, I sometimes have had uh, struggles around this, uh, doing a lot of Zoom and uh, videos and, and, and phone calls. Um, that's almost uh, an overwhelming amount in certain circumstances. So I've had to balance that out with my need to spend time alone to be able to create what I wanted to create. So each of you, of course, will be able to weigh that with, for yourselves and uh, dive into that space. Um, but to know that, you know, we're all, um, we're all in this, doing this together. We're all collectively in this space to um, help each other through this. And I hope that when more of the uh, reopening takes place, that more of us can get together to help rebuild not in the same way we were doing it in 2019 or before, but in a new, uh, a wholly new way of operating that is not about um, at each other's throats, but about actual cooperation and collaboration, co-creation uh, with, from, from a heart and a consciousness you know, rather than um, from a place of judgment and a blame. So of course this is a, a an optimistic view, um, but I, I do have uh, a certain amount of faith that humanity will get through this and thrive in the future. Uh, and so this will just set up more information I can share at later times, but I, I wish you all well uh, with peace and love and harmony for everyone and uh, to dream well, to, to learn from that and to, to know that the stars and the planets and the signs uh, are all with you, that Mother Earth is with you and we're here to help each other through this. Be well and thank you for watching.